Hello, good evening. Um, I'm Fia Backstrom and I'm assistant professor at the Cooper Union School of Art. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to um, our continued public art fund talks at the Cooper Union. So tonight is the final of four programs in our fall 2020 virtual series that were organized around public art funds New York City exhibitions, like the one that we're soon going to learn about. These exhibitions have for over 40 years introduced both new and renowned voices in art whose work addresses the critical issues of our time. We want to thank the team of Public Art Fund for making such art accessible to all New Yorkers and also for partnering with us at Cooper Union to bring this kind of programming forward. If you liked the kind of programming that you'll see here tonight, please come back and join us, whether it be online through Zoom as we are now or eventually in person once again. Our programs are free and open to the public and you can find all of them on the Cooper Union website on the events and exhibition page at www.cooper.edu. So without further ado, I would like to welcome Public Art Fund's curator, Daniel Palmer, who will introduce tonight's featured speaker, Davina Simo, and who will also moderate a discussion about her work, Reverberation. As curator of Public Art Fund, Daniel has organized multiple exhibitions, including tonight's program, and the subject of last month's virtual talk, Sam Moyer's Doors of Doris. Before joining Public Art Fund, Daniel was the Leon Levi Assistant Curator at the Jewish Museum. He has also written for Art News, the Brooklyn Rail, Guernica, and more. So please join me in welcoming Daniel Palmer. Thanks, Fia, for that great introduction. Um, and thank you. Uh, sorry, just making sure we're seen. Yes, okay. Uh, and thank you so much to Cooper Union for having us tonight. Uh, thanks especially to Miranda, Kim, and Katerina, and the others who are working so diligently behind the scenes to make sure everything is uh, technologically running smoothly. Um, and especially a big, big, big thank you to Davina, Davina Simo, uh, for this talk tonight and for your brilliant exhibition, Reverberation, at Brooklyn Bridge Park. Uh, it really has been an honor to curate this and to collaborate on this really special uh, exhibition and just to see the, the city uh, and get to enjoy it. So um, before we start, uh, I just want to take care of a few uh, housekeeping issues. I want to um, uh, take the opportunity to thank many of the donors uh, who have generously supported our talks program, uh, including Con Edison, the New York State Council for the Arts, uh, sorry, New York State Council on the Arts, and the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs. We're grateful for your ongoing support uh, of this free public programming. I also want to thank the donors and partners who helped to make reverberation possible. In particular, thank you to our board members, director circle members, and the exhibition supporters who have joined us this evening, including uh, presenting sponsor, Bloomberg Philanthropies, Patty Silverstein and Wendy Fisher, and of course, the fearless Jessica Silverman and her great team. Uh, as well as our friends at UAP, who sponsor Public Art Fund's Director Circle. And we couldn't do it without our site partner, Brooklyn Bridge Park. Uh, I also want to let all of the audience members know um, that uh, there is closed captioning available for tonight's talk at the bottom of your screen. Uh, and also at the bottom of your screen uh, is a Q&A uh, button. So we're going to have a portion of the talk tonight of a Q&A with Davina. So please be sure to send us your questions. Uh, you can type them in at any point during the talk. So now let me introduce Davina with her official biography. Davina Simo. Uh, has a BA in visual arts from Brown University and an MFA from University of California, San Diego. Simo has shown extensively throughout the United States and Europe. Her work has recently been featured in numerous group exhibitions, including the San Francisco Arts Commission, Contemporary Jewish Museum in San Francisco, and Parts and Labor in Beacon, where it was exhibited alongside uh, paintings by Deborah Remington. She presented solo exhibitions at three galleries in 2019, Marlboro Contemporary in New York, Jessica Silverman in San Francisco, and Rubordi Tetas in Geneva. And in 2020, opened her first solo institutional exhibition at the DeRosa Museum in Napa. 
Simo is represented by Jessica Silverman in San Francisco and Ribordi Betaz in Geneva. Uh, Davina lives and works in San Francisco. Okay, now that that's over with, we've taken care of all that. Um, thank you so much, Davina, for joining us tonight. Thank you. Uh, let's start with a brief discussion about reverberation, about the work specifically um, could you start by describing reverberation and, you know, what you were hoping to achieve with this exhibition? And maybe while we're doing that, Miranda can pull up um, the first few slides, uh, two through five, and we can um, see the exhibition in a little bit uh, great technicolor detail there, too. Great. Um, thank you, Daniel. Thank you for the introduction and also just for um, all your help and work on this project. Um, it's been a really humbling project for me to work on. Um, reverberation is five bells that we installed along Pier 1 in Brooklyn Bridge Park. Um, they, each bell is housed in a single structure um, made of I-beams and each bell is unique. They each feature a different um, pattern of holes. Uh, it's not a like uniform pattern, but a different array of holes. And that creates a different graphic element when you look at the bell from afar and also when you are um, under it ringing it. That's great. Um, I, I think, you know, in particular, I'd be curious to, uh, to hear a little bit more from you about um, the, the pearlescent, you know, orange pink color of them, because right. as you can see in this image, that's for a lot of people like the very first thing they notice, almost even maybe before they realize the variations of the whole patterns that you were just describing. Do you want to um, explain a little bit more about that? And, yeah. you know, why, why did you choose to paint them in that way? Yeah, so the color is this very incredible, beautiful color that is um, a really vibrant orange, but the highlights are pink. So when you see like, you know, it, it's interesting because um, when you paint something like a, a car, you see different highlights in the different shapes. When you paint something like a bell, you walk around and you're always seeing kind of the same shape because it's a symmetrical form. Mm -hmm. So the, the pink highlight, it's like almost like something you're trying to catch, but you see it in this way where you see it, but it's almost out of view. And so what you really see is this vibrant orange. And um, this was an important part of the concept of the piece. Um, I wanted these bells to um, function in a way as a call to attention and, um, the color was part of that, was picking a color that you wouldn't necessarily see in that landscape otherwise. Um, that site is so beautiful with the water and the park and then all the buildings in the background. So you see a lot of blue, green, and gray. Mm. And I wanted the bells to really stand out against the background and um, against the city and also to be a color of alarm. Like we had talked in the beginning about um, choosing an international orange, which is like a color, it's not, it's not a single color, but it's like, there's different ways that color is interpreted in the world, but it's a color that like airplanes see and that you can see through fog. And it's a specific color that relates to this idea of an alarm. And that's great because in a way, the, the location along that Pier 1 at Brooklyn Bridge Park, um, it does have this maritime history to it, you know, and that safety orange, while it's a, a you know, aeronautic uh, reference and, and, you know, for, for other uh, things like that, it also has this um, boat you know, maritime uh, quality to it. And that ties together the form of the bell, which is obviously so central to, uh, to maritime communication, as well as to urban and civic spaces. Um, you know, you've said such uh, thoughtful things before about bells and how they function in cities and in civic life. Um, I, I wonder, you know, ha has that sort of continued through? Has, has your thinking evolved on that now that you have these sort of democratized bells that are here that any visitor can walk right up to and ring? 
Um, it's it's been a really uh, incredible experience to see so many different people ringing the bells and. Um, I guess the element of joy was a little bit unexpected. Um, I mean, I don't mean that to be like a downer. I just wasn't, that wasn't like my, I didn't realize how much like joy would be involved in the public interacting mm. with these bells. Um, I guess I had thought about them as this kind of, you know, we had talked, I think we'll talk about some of the proposals later, but we had talked at some point about doing a structure that held multiple bells. Mm -hmm. And we had moved more towards this bell, this structure that housed a single bell. And I was excited about that because the bell, the, the, the individual sculptures would invite a personal interaction with the bell and with the landscape and with the city and mm -hmm. um, just the whole experience was really set up to be one-on-one -on -one, but mm -hmm. of course to involve everyone in the park through uh the sound element yeah. um and, and that seems to relate um you know to, to a lot of our earlier conversations about the idea of having a bell in public space as you know an art form uh, you know that you've worked with so so much and we can get into that in a second but uh, uh, you know, that it really is a, a bit of a rethinking or remixing uh, of, a, of a traditional civic form. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. I was excited about that. When I started making bells, it was almost like just a sort of curiosity. Mm -hmm. And when I started making them, I was so excited about um, this kind of synthesis of getting to do what I love in the studio, like this very physical, creative uh, exploration with materials and with form, but then to have this also, this like form that people know and but to be able to bring it into a more contemporary context that's not associated with religion, that's not associated with like um, an institution that's like, keeping things on a schedule for you, but was really like allowed to be brought into this artistic, creative realm. Um, so yeah, it does feel, um, you know, democratic to me in that way. Yeah, it's wonderful the way that, you know, there are bells around the city, church bells and city hall and, and things like that. But, um, the, you know, you, I, I, you use the term um, previously talking about them, maybe, or just an expression, talking about them as being a little bit sort of obsolete or, or le having less relevance in our current moment for, for one reason or another, and maybe for better or worse. Um, but it really feels like the, the way you've sort of brought that bell down to, to, um, to human, scale, human level and, and frankly, human scale. I mean, they're really, they're large bells, but they're about, you know, four feet tall um, that, that are sort of elevated, not too far above, uh, you know, City. And a lot of times the bells are kind of hidden out of the way uh, in, in those church buildings or things like that. You really brought them down. And um, to your point before about bells, uh, about each of these really having its own unique experience, interaction with it, as well as the kind of community, uh, you know, hearing the sound, uh, they each really do have their own character, not just because of the whole patterns you were describing, but also because of the slight, the way that the whole patterns create slight variations to the amount of bronze that's in them, uh, right? Do you want to sort of explain how you kind of thought through these unique identities for, and the name of the, the names of them, they're individually named as well, right? Reflector, singer, dreamer, listener, and mother. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, I, it's kind of a, lo a lot of thoughts at once, but like, um, one thing is that a lot of the ways that bells are made in um, the world is like very mathematical and it's made in order to create this perfect sound. And so that's why, you know, you'll often see the silhouette of bells in like a church tower or something like far up, but it's always, you know, there's like a, a Western bell and an Eastern, I mean, the, the mm. Eastern bells I think are actually a lot more interesting, but um, I really wanted to, when I started making these in the studio, I was immediately excited about the sound, but like very unattached to making a specific sound mm -hmm. and interested in like, what's a bell? 
how do you make a bell that's not bell and putting holes in the bell was something that was interesting mm -hmm. to me because it was going to like necessarily mess with the symmetry and mess with the sound and so I felt like the sound that was produced from that bell would be more um, like artistic in a way just mm -hmm. less um, you know more of a discovery like there would be no way to hear it until you could hear it mm. and um in general the way the bells uh the there are factors that i can control to to affect the sound but um so the holes the holes are kind of one factor mm. and in terms of the titles um it was important to me that you know, obviously they're all painted the same color and they're all in the same structure. And I wanted to kind of like spread the exhibition along the pier in a way where you could hear the different bells and it was like a continuous exhibition, but where you could also have people having their own experience with them in different parts of the park. Mm. And in that same way, I wanted to take advantage of the idea of titling them so that they could each have their own um, kind of character. And so, I don't know, um, to go through it briefly, the first bell that you encounter when you get that auto taxi or if you come from the subway is titled Mother. And I was interested in that one, just, just in having this like strong protective energy be the first bell that you see. And also for that, um, it has this whole pattern where it has like two X's. Mm. And so of interested in almost this like shield like when you're making a bell you really are making this like protective shell it's like a metallic mm -hmm. um it's like literally a protective shell but then it also has this whole interior space and i think that um that was so in important to me as like uh um I don't know if it's conceptual, but like the idea of that inner space is very important to me. Mm -hmm. And um the holes kind of merge those two spaces, the interior and exterior, and they bring light into this like interior space. So I was interested in that um, mother being this kind of like strong first presence where, you know, there's sort of this like invitation, but also a bit of a, of a remove. Mm -hmm. um, the next bell is reflector and just kind of quickly that was about this idea of self-reflection that um, ringing a bell kind of gives you an opportunity to have, um, I mean, I think about it as like setting an intention, but it's just a moment where, you know, you're ringing bells for celebration or to mourn or for, there's like all these occasions historically, but when you're engaging with an artwork in the city, it's kind of this like moment of reflection. Mm -hmm. um, Listener was one we kind of talked about while we were working on it and that made me more excited about it, but um, It's just this quality of active listening and kind of this like flip side of the bell, which is that it like relies on an active listener to like really function as a bell. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there's so much focus on like making the sound and being the one ringing, but really like the listeners are the ones who are also um, kind of participating in the the, um, you know, the experience. Yeah. Um, Singer was about the musical potential of the work and just like creating an uh, interactive work in public was like mm -hmm. just a really exciting opportunity for me. And, and I wanted to acknowledge the, you know, just all the musicians in New York and like, you know, we ended up um, installing it during COVID and there were all these like seven o'clock chants for the healthcare workers. And I wanted this like singing to be part of it, this like, mm -hmm. um, and then Dreamer is the bell that's installed closest to the Statue of Liberty. And um, partially I was, um, wanted to kind of, you know, uh, New York City was like such a site for immigration. Um, I, I come from a family of immigrants and I am horrified by how our country has been treating immigrants. And, um, you know, I wanted to kind of like take in that view and the site of like not only um, this being New York City, but seeing Statue of Liberty and like 
calling up the dreamers as just sort of one example of like this word we're kind of using as a stand-in for immigrants, but also to talk about the project itself and Bell's having this capacity for dreaming. Um, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And in the, in, in the sense that you've talked, you know, about, about these Bell's as having this aspect of urgent alarm, but especially as being this kind of call towards a hopeful hopefulness and, and, that being fundamental to communication, uh, especially in this, yeah. No, I love that. Um, uh, thank you for, for walking us through each of them as well. I think that's really um, helpful for everyone who maybe sort of experiences them and doesn't necessarily see, oh, okay, there's a little bit of a differentiation, but um, to see how much really went into each of the, um, you know, every consideration of each of them, I think is really uh, important. Let's um, talk a little bit about the background of how you came to the Bells. You started to address a little bit of that before, but um, on slide six, if we could pull that up, Miranda, we have um, some images of, of Bells that you've made before um, and, and others. Uh, and, and it really shows, you know, this was kind of, you know, my coming to your work was partly, you know, seeing the bells that you had made in the past and, and in our dialogue, thinking about how they could work, uh, you know, how bells could work in a public setting. And, um, you know, you really sort of evolved the bell form and, and bell, or maybe not, you know, the form, I guess, is a bit consistent, but you, consistent, but you evolved, um, you know, your, your process, your thinking about what the bells are doing. Do you want to sort of uh, w walk us through that? And maybe, you know, as a, by way of a question, you know, why did you gravitate towards this form maybe originally early on and how have, you know, we, we see sort of three very different examples of it here. Um, and, and then especially, you know, what did the process of doing reverberation, uh, you know, teach you about making the bells and, and sort of how, how is that ultimately expressed um, differently in the, ex in the works in the exhibition as well as maybe where the bells are gonna continue to go from here? Well, um, at the beginning, I used a very simple method, um, which is I took a chain, um, which is a material I've worked with a lot and have in the studio and have like just looked at a lot um, and made a curve. And that's um, called a catenary curve. And it's the same, it's actually repeated in Brooklyn Bridge Park, uh, the bridge itself um, but that form is like an engineering um, it's used in engineering it's a very strong like stable form hmm. and I turned it upside down and so when you turn that upside down that's how you get the form that I've been working with um, I think uh, I guess I was just attracted to the form like I like the idea that it would be strong in terms of its shape and um, you know when you when I'm making the bells I built a machine in the studio that I make them with and it's built around a pottery wheel so when you're thinking about it from the perspective of a maker um, you're creating a symmetrical form and so it's all about like you know there's limit there's um, cons Th this form, I, I liked how they looked and I felt like they had a real relationship to the body. Um, mm -hmm. These bells that are in the images, um, like the, the one in the center is almost three feet tall. It's a little shy of three feet tall. So indoors or outdoors, you're, it's almost like you're, you're encountering another body mm -hmm. um, in terms of like the size and the shape, the overall shape. Um, I've played a lot with that, mostly just as a studio interest, like, and in terms of being curious about how different sounds would come up. I've made bells that have very irregular textures in the surface. Um, this black one that's in the picture um, hardly sounds like a bell at all. I really like pushed it mm. too far with the sculptural aspects, but I love how it looks and it's really interesting in concert with the other bells because the other ones really vibrate and make mm -hmm. that kind of um, you know resonant sound that you think of with a bell and you know you really can kind of see and hear how these forms um, 
you know, kind of like, what is a bell? Uh, yeah, and it shows that you're continuing to play with that sort of variation on a theme, uh, you know, way of working. Um, I think, for example, you know, the bell that we're seeing on the left, it worked so successfully. And I remember when I saw it and rang it um, in, in your exhibition, uh, I laughed out loud because it's sort of like, it almost is, is a, it, it, it gained so much in relationship to the to the different resonances of the other bells that it was shown with. Yeah, uh, with yeah. and I've made other ones where I've like carved a spiral down the whole bell. And, you know, I was kind of interested in that. And also in terms of like, you know, when you have like a groove and a record or there's just mm -hmm. so many things about music that are um, a consequence of form. Mm -hmm. And so I was interested in like how the kind of mark making that I do aesthetically in other works, like a lot of my cast work, it's not making, you're not making music with it. It's not interactive. Like I'm very much a studio mm. artist. Um, I was very excited about how that, those kind of like marks would work in the bells and how they would, um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it's, no, that's like true. A lot of, a lot of like room to try things. Well, um, well, I think that's really important to note as well as, you know, it's like, you're not a musician artist first, you're an artist, you're a sculptor, and then the, the musical or interactive component of it is, is you know, uh, almost is, a, is an aspect of, of how you're, you're exploring form and, and, and its function and its purpose. Um, and that was also a part of obviously the discussions around the clapper, you know, and, and coming to that brass clapper that really has a bit of a clanging quality to it, but that was a part of um, sort of, uh, you know, how, how, it's, uh, how, how the works are intended to be received right now. Um, let's continue on to slide seven. Uh, and, and we can sort of also address maybe some of the other kind of motifs that do have roots in other parts of your practice, because your practice is, you know, as a sculptor is very diverse. Um, although there are real um, through lines, there are threads that run throughout it. Um, you know, in particular, the bearing pieces that you've made, like the one on the left and, and the chain pieces, like on the right, um, have, you know, elements that are, that are continued um, in, in, rever in the works for reverberation. Um, do you want to sort of highlight a little bit more of what made you kind of connect those things uh, in this work? Yeah, um, the, the bearings work on the left, um, those, those works have been so interesting to revisit. Um, during COVID and like the um, number of maps that we're like bombarded with and all the like data points and city. Mm -hmm. I imagine them as like maps, but sort of like psychological maps or create, you know, I would like take liberties with them in the studio and just think of them as like, um, you know, all kinds of maps, like, like aerial views when you're in a plane and you see a mm -hmm. city at night or when you're looking at like, you know, the path you're gonna take from one place to another, or astrological signs or a network. I was thinking about all these different like ways of like plotting information and mm -hmm. um, these holes being like, um, I don't know, I've thought of a, a lot about like, I've just been working with these like uh, patterns using holes mm -hmm. and I, <laughs> I've been, I have multiple like journal entries during the pandemic of like, why, what is it about holes? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, I don't know. Um, but I think that in terms of our project, these mm -hmm. works um, and like the different, the, the variety of them and the way that they all, you know, they, they look different, mm -hmm. um, really informed how the whole patterns might look on the bells. I mean, it's a different because it was a 2D, 2D, um, you know, it's like a flat surface versus a bell. Yeah. But um, I started using the same drill bits that I was using in those pieces to make these bells. So that was kind of like, there was like a direct translation in my world, even though it's kind of looks different. And then the chain works, um, perhaps this one we pulled out because of the kind of like, shape yeah it's like um, a door almost yeah yeah it's like a door um i thought about it like a passageway um door a, a threshold um i have 
been working with chain for a long time. Um, I thought about these pieces as wall drawings that could scale. Hmm. And so when we started working with, you know, talking about this public project, um, you know, I was naturally inclined to use the chain as like the kind of way we'd hang the bells. Um, yeah. I think in general, there's like an industrial uh, feel. There's a, there's an industrial aspect to a lot of the materials I'm drawn to. Yeah. Um, I, I don't, I think sometimes that might create this idea that things are like machine made or produced in a, mm machine process which you know a lot of my work's really made in the studio with mm -hmm. with with like a foundry or with other yeah. like i use a lot of machines but that aren't in the studio but um i think that this chain work does share a kind of language with the project at brooklyn bridge park oh absolutely i mean um i, I think from the start it was very clear that doing a public project, you know, you doing a public project was going to require the sort of studio aspect um, to, to be, you know, in integral or, or and fundamental in a lot of ways. Um, so often, you know, you're, you're clearly not one of these artists who will have everything done by a fabricator. You really um, at least need to have the germ of it. Um, you know, be something that happens, occurs in the studio. And I think, you know, the wonderful background that you have behind you right now uh, in the studio of all these, uh, you know, wax uh, molds of, of bells, you know, to come or, or things like this and, and the, the plaster forms of them really shows how hands-on you really are, uh, you know, at the, at the origin point and, and how collaborative you are um, with, with the fabricators, you know, that you work with. Um, do you want to kind of walk us through a little bit as well um, the, the fabrication sort of process and, you know, how, how you know, because obviously it was, a, it was a very particular moment to do this, um, but, you know, and, and we really kind of we're, we're doing, you know, the, all the fabrication and everything, you know, during COVID um, and installation during, you know, the, the, the worst moments, um, you know, uh, but I think, it, sorry. The last plane ride I took was like a, a flight to LA that I literally flew there and back in the same day, which I know that a lot of people do that, but I don't, um, yeah, I don't yeah. like I've never done that before. I, I'm like a really tenuous moment too. And, and it was fundamental to, yeah, to, to moving the project forward. Yeah. Well, I could listen to the first cast bell because I was like so nervous about it. Mm. Uh, but yeah, so the process for the bells in this project was a little different than how I work um, on smaller scale bells that have been in galleries, even like the bigger, smaller scale. But this was like, taking it to a much larger scale where um we have some great uh process images of you here with your drill set up and of the at the painter shop too yeah. um so normally i make the bells in the studio using this machine i mentioned before that i built around a pottery wheel and um it's actually right here oh, ah. yeah you got the jig set up yeah but um anyway uh, for this, I made a wax bell in the studio, like I normally do, and then we had it 3D scanned and enlarged and then 3D printed. And then we made a mold, which is something I haven't done before, but it worked really well for this project. And then we, a lot of the sound in a bell comes from the thickness of the rim. And so that was a big consideration for a new size bell that was this big and that was going to be outside because you know the the bells are already pretty loud in a gallery mm -hmm. like it's not it's not like like we've gone through um a number of different materials for the clappers to find like the right sound for an indoor situation mm -hmm. this was a totally new experience of like we're going to be in this you know loud part of the city with the water and like how so um, there was a lot of educated guesswork in terms of like um, how to design the profile of the bell. And I have kind of a mentor, um, friend um, 
who's like, he's, I, I, you know, I, I ran it by a few people, but um, in the end it was kind of like sucking it up and like making a guess about, you know, how to, and so then each bell was pulled from the same mold. And mm -hmm. then I worked on each bell, like in this photo, um, very much by hand um, to, yeah, to make each one its own, its own bell. Mm. Uh, and then the, the casting process, as you were sort of describing before, was obviously a, a really integral part of it as well. You want to talk through the sort of technical part of the casting and, yeah. and, the, paint, and the painting as well? Yeah, so the casting, um, I work with using the lost wax method, which is an ancient technique. And um, we actually discussed using like a different technique for these bells, which is also very interesting. And, you know, if you've seen like Andre Rublev or if you're, a foundry nerd or if you are interested in like foundry um it you know it's a fascinating like i mean i'm i'm definitely one of those um obsessed but you can cast the whole bell in the ground um mm -hmm. and i was interested in doing that but um are you know the way i made all these other bells is with the lost wax process and in the end in order to kind of like make the sculpture I wanted. That was the method. And what you do is we made this bell and then we cut it into three pieces mm -hmm. to cast because it was too big. That's mm -hmm. the thing, like all the other bells I've made, I've cast in one piece and I've gone to kind of great lengths. Like literally the 32 inch bell that I've made a lot, like made this form, mm -hmm. the maximum size my foundry can cast in one piece. Like it's literally the, the absolute maximum size of their tank. Mm -hmm. so, this bell, in order to be in public, it was like, I knew it was going to have to be cut up and re-welded together, which again, it was just making sure the foundry like used the same alloy. And there was just a lot of like considerations to try to like protect the sound and protect the like thickness of the walls. Hmm. Um, but a lot of, a lot of the work I do is done in collaboration with foundry, you know, with the foundry and with, um, Met other metal workers and so I'm very like that's part of what I do every day is like a lot of back and forth and conversation and just explaining you know kind of like thinking through in advance like how are we going to do this to achieve what we want and mm -hmm. then the bells were painted in LA um through the foundry I had discussed a couple I um that was what we en ended up making the most sense yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, and then in the next image too, we can see a little bit of the sort of installation process, you know, which there's a great image here of, uh, of one of the installers, first of all, on the left, you know, it's of course during a hurricane cause it's 2020. So, you know, why course, not? Uh, and then, and then on the right, thankfully, you know, it was all done safely, but, uh, the, the inner mechanics of it, you know, require someone getting up in there uh, to be able to attach the clapper and kind of have this sort of, uh, you know, chain heading down, you know, pulling down to that. It also, I think, nicely actually gives a scale of like how, how massive um, these works actually are. Um, you know, and maybe just sort of reflecting on the installation process um, and, you know, what it means to have a work in public space in 2020, you know, like for you as a New Yorker, um, you know, what was it, what has it been like to develop a work in the city, you know, where you spent your formative years um, uh, as an artist and as a person, you know, uh, and then maybe on the, on the next slide as well, on slide um, 10, we have, you know, great images of, of uh, audience participation, you know, with the work. Uh, what has it been like, you know, to, to see people interact with it in, in the way that, that they really have, have taken to, to their, their location? Um, well, I guess in terms of um, making it in New York and like it, the um, it's like a few different questions. I guess the, Sorry. I don't know, it's kind of crazy. I can't believe this sculpture is even there. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I lived in New York. Um, I don't know, it's funny, like even having, um, it, I just learned, I like living in New York was such a like important part of my life and mm -hmm. especially artistically, like, 
-hmm. it was funny to have Fia introduce this talk because when I had first moved to New York, she was like a friend of a few friends of mine and I never got to meet her. I only knew her work and it's just like crazy, you know, New York's such like a magical place as an artist. Like not only do you learn, like I learned that like you could be an artist as an adult. Mm -hmm. Like I didn't previously know that was even a possibility. Um, the only artist adults I had known were teachers, not in a bad way. I just, that, you know, it's such a hard job to get now to be a teacher. Um, anyway, mm -hmm. New York was such a significant place for me that I was so excited to be able to make this work. And, um, you know, I like that other slide where you can see like during the install where you can see like the bridge and like the forms basically like repeated in the, in On the, the sculpture. If we go to the next slide, oh yeah, either the slide before and then actually um, I think slide 11 also sort of shows the bell in relationship to the, to the bridge there, yeah. It's like, I don't know, it's just magical. I mean, I, we talked a lot about the structure. We went through a lot of different structure options and you know, when you make a bell, there's this like ancient book I was reading about bell making and the author's mm -hmm. kind of annoying, but he really like got my heart when he started complaining about how if you want to make bells, you have to like become an engineer and then you have to mm -hmm. make something to hang them from and then you have to figure out what to like ring them with. And it's like a lot of, uh, it's a lot, you know, like when you want to just show a bell, it's like you're yeah. really making this whole other housing and I really was excited to be able to see the city through it and to really like keep it as open as possible hmm. um, and to kind of engage with the architecture. Um, I was excited to like have it be in this location where it's like facing Wall Street, hmm. you could see the Statue of Liberty, you can see like basically that form repeated in like all the buildings across mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and the installation was so weird because I'm a very like, you know, a studio rat. It's like, I don't know, that's what my like advisor in grad school was like, you're a studio rat. And I was like, <laughs> is that? But um, like, I love the studio, you know, that's like, yeah. I, I love, I'm like a studio person. And so like my days out, like the highlight for me is install. Like I love yeah. being, on site you know i love that that's like a magical part because your like work is you see it out of the studio mm -hmm. so it was super weird because um i mean weird's not the right word but you know we planned this out to a t like i've never been with worked with such an amazing team where like every single part of it was drawn out and like we knew all the hardware we had so many discussions about it it was like so much like hardware fetish and then and then i was like installing over facetime which worked very easily because it was all planned mm -hmm. but it was also like so emotionally um you know not not traumatic but just hard it was just so hard to not be there and um at the same time to like when the bells finally went up and people were like allowed to be in public, it was like, you know, this has just been the craziest year. It was so amazing to have this project up in public. Yeah. You know, like literally the simplest pleasures are what we all want right now. Just like walking outside, you know, so I don't know. I'm going to stop talking. No, absolutely. Absolutely. Divina. I, you're entirely right. Um, and, and I really think that, well, first of all, we, we're going to, let's move to questions and answers now because it's about um, 15 minutes left um, until six o'clock. So, um, but, but I think, you know, to the, to the point you just made, um, it really, the bells really have been uh, so well received. I mean, a number of the questions actually are more statements, you know, uh, I walk past these bells every day. I love them, you know, specifically, I love the color, but you know, why, why that color, um, you know, which, which you were sort of talking a little bit about before. Do you want to kind of um, sort of elaborate on that a, a bit more, um, you know, in vis-a-vis -vis of what you were just talking about, about the long distance views, you know, from, yeah from the Manhattan side, you know, from the, from the way that they relate to the grayness of the city as well. Yeah. 
I guess to elaborate on it, I, you know, um, think a lot, or I mean, I just am like always like rethinking and thinking again. And I thought a lot about the color. Um, should there be five different colors, you know, and it was like, when you're making a project where you're dealing with the pier is like the exhibition space, but really the exhibition space is like this whole landscape. Mm. Um, I, you know, I, I don't have a problem with decorative color, but I didn't want the color to just be like, a, I wanted the color to have like a meaning to it, you know, mm. and have mm. kind of like a, a way in which you'd like identify the project as, um, you know, what's that color about? Like, you know, where it would create a curiosity as opposed to like a rainbow of colors or like, mm -hmm. you know, I like to work with the uh, RAL color palette, which is like mm -hmm. the industrial color. It's like a international industrial color palette. And, um, you know, so it probably wouldn't have been a rainbow even if it was five colors but mm -hmm. still it was gonna be i don't know i was just interested in this like impact of like wanting change and wanting like um progress and like wanting like attention to things and it's been a very weird year for that because you know obviously we planned this project before COVID. i don't know if it's obvious but we planned the project before covid like we wow. were um yeah. supposed to open in may and so with like an install timeline this is like all was a lot of work like it's a lot of like physical work not just for me but like the foundry and yeah like a a lot of work um mm -hmm. and so this like desire for change it's it's a very interesting time and an exciting time to have the bells there because like there's that's such a like topic like people yeah. are talking about change all the time now and I love that like that's or that's something I identify with is like embracing but, change absolutely and I think that you know you were sort of talking about it before but the sort of bells as an alarm but also as celebration also as joy you know an expression of joy in the way that like I think every day that there's something new that happens in the news, it almost makes the bells take on a different resonance. <laughs> sometimes negative, sometimes positive. Um, well, okay, great. We're getting a number of questions about um, sort of bells remind are reminding me of this our artist our art historical reference or that including you know talking about Arco Santi in New Mexico and asking about Solari as an, as an influence um, as well as another question um, you know asking about uh, Al Taylor and Martin Purrier you know are there are there other references for you that that have have come there into the work um, yeah um, I'm uh... Yeah, yes. I mean, I was very, I'm very excited. I like the idea that everyone knows what a bell is and that like we all have so many, such a like clear knowledge when you're a kid, like my three-year-old son, I mean, it's partially because of me, but he's like <laughs> very much knows what bells are. Yeah. <laughs> but I think most kids do. I mean, it's like a thing, but it's, um, you know, actually the man who taught me how to make bells, Nick DeFilippo, who, um, probably isn't watching this, but who I love um, very much. He worked at Arco Santi and he, um, you know, in the end he makes bells in a different way. Like what they were making technically was like more of wind chimes, um, but they're also very beautiful. I guess like when I look at that, I, I, I think, I don't know if that makes my work, it's not, uh, I don't, I feel like we're very different artists. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's like very, I love that project and I love that like desire for like, you know, a um, utopian community. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm not a pessimist, but I mean like, I'm just not, th that's not my life. Like I don't, <laughs> I mean, maybe one day, but um <laughs> But yeah, I do. I mean, I definitely like look at a, I look at like a ton of art. I mean, I'm an art. Mm. That's all I do, li literally. <laughs> <laughs> it's being like a mom and, uh, you know, there are other things I do, but mostly I look at art. And so uh, it, 
I wouldn't say Arco Santi was like an inspiration for this project, but in terms of making bells, like I think they de that that experience of living there definitely inspired Nick and Nick's enthusiasm for it is what like allowed me to learn how to make bells, even though it's a different technique. Yeah. Well, that's yeah. great. And, and also in terms of, you know, other things that are in the work, there were obviously a lot of people asking about um, other artists and, and, you know, art historical references, but somebody made a comment before about um, the San Francisco, the Golden Gate Bridge, you know, and like the color, not only the color, but also, you know, in my mind, the, the catenary arches and the engineering and the industrial materials, you know, the, the bent I-beams and things like that really all seem present in the work. Do you, do you sort of see it that way too? Yeah, we talked about it in the beginning, remember? Like, cause like yeah. the, the, the Golden Gate Bridge is not golden, which is yeah. <laughs> in my mind when I moved here. I was like, what is everyone talking about? This isn't yeah. gold at oh, all, it's yeah. bright. But it's, uh, it's so beautiful. Like I love New York and I also, it was so weird to like move, um, mm -hmm. but I love living here and like, uh, um, you know, we drive over that bridge all the time. Like we, you know, go to the park right near that bridge. And I think mm -hmm. that like that color is just, it's, it's also an international orange mm -hmm. that that's mm -hmm. what the color is. It's mm -hmm. just different. Mm -hmm. it's, it's obviously much more matte or, and yeah. it's, uh, redder. Um, but it's the same idea of like a color that you can see through the fog. You can see it against the, um, water. Mm, mm. the shapes are very you know bridge, bridge. yeah and, and, and the two bridges right because there's the bridge where you currently are in san francisco you know and then the brooklyn bridge that's right behind you know and yeah. manhattan too, course, but, so you yeah, know there's yeah. a lot of bridge in my life in new york yeah. Um, so we're, we're getting a number of questions also about um, the sound of the bells, you know, and, and I just, you know, it's true, like it, it doesn't make sense right now because we're not here, we're not at the park um, to be able to sort of play each of them. I will say, if you haven't been able to get down to Brooklyn Bridge Park to see Davina Simo's reverberation in person, I would greatly encourage you to. The bells are on view until April 18th. Um, if you can't get there in person, because you're maybe somewhere outside of New York City right now or aren't able to make it to the park, um, we have a great video uh, uh, of the exhibition with some more info. Davina, um, being interviewed on that and there's there's video um w with the audio uh, of the bells as well so that's on the public art fund website um on the reverberation exhibition page but um do you want to talk a little bit more maybe you know about the sort of subtle variations you know of these and in terms of how how you've played with tone in bells in the past and and um, the tonal differences that maybe are also about like where you're standing in relationship to a bell when it's when it's wrong. Uh, of yeah. Um, so as I had mentioned, that these bells were made in a different process than I make them in the studio, and um, kind of for a lot of technical reasons, we had to like decide on a thickness of the rim, which like mm -hmm. really affects the sound. And um, the, the holes do affect the sound, but not in, you know, if you had asked like a bell master in the, or like a, they're called a bell founder, but if you had asked my imaginary bell founder in the past, like, you know, I want to put a bunch of holes in the bell. They'd be like, oh my yeah, God. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's like, I don't know. It's just another thing where like you can do a lot that people say you can't do and it's actually sure. fine to do it and it still sounds great, but it doesn't affect the bells as much as I thought mm -hmm. it might. Um, mm -hmm. I think if we had wanted to create completely different bell sounds, that would have been achievable. It would have been a lot more expensive because we would have, is that it? we basically uh, would have had to create five different molds. Uh, yeah. I see. Yeah. Um, we just, I mean, this was already. Yeah. Well, it's also a question of what you're trying to accomplish and what the real sort of end goal is. Yeah, right? Yeah, it wasn't the primary goal. Mm. I think it's like, um, it's interesting seeing the public 
reaction to it and kind of like people are definitely curious for different sounds and I think that that could motivate in the future like you know I could kind of like indulge that more um but but um I'm not sure if I'm answering the question there's a lot of considerations no. um cost is uh one um <laughs> <laughs> just like because there's actually a lot that goes into all of this but in the bells that I make here um, I do vary the sound quite a bit like in terms of each almost you know probably it would be easier for people if I made more consistency with them but they're actually like there's a lot of like or you know there's a lot of variation in them and I think that's a nice thing about making the bells I wish I could like have them all in a room at the same time. A lot of times I only have one or two at the studio and, you know. Well, it sounds like the, you know, the retrospective is gonna have to have them all together, isn't it? <laughs> um, and, and maybe to sort of, you know, start to work towards wrapping things up, we, we got a question about, um, you know, what would you do differently if the project happened again? You know, and maybe if, if we had the sort of dream scenario where COVID, you know, never sort of disrupted the timing and, and you know, the, the transportation and uh, as you were saying, the installation and all of that, um, you know, what, what, how would you change, how would you change the project in, in any way? Um, or maybe, you know, on the other side of it, like, what do you hope, you know, in the last remaining months that the works are on view, what do you, how do you hope people, um, you know, that, that the context or the experience of them changes even? Well, I would be in New York right now. Um, <laughs> I love to have you here. We'd love to have you here with the bells, and and we hope we can soon. Um, you know, I think that the experience people have been having has been really great. It was a lot more than I imagined. Like, um, and I've had a lot of friends visiting the bells and sending me pictures, like from different, like mul going back multiple times, and. Um, you know, and every time there's kids playing with them, there's like people, like I've literally seen photos from two different weddings, which I'm sure there's, I don't know, I'm not sure there's more, but I mean, like, that's just things people have sent me. Yeah. Um, you know, it's very humbling to see so many people interacting with these. I mean, I'm, uh, I work by myself every day, like in a, room by myself so like this is amazing to get to see so many people interacting with them and you know there was a lot of fear with COVID at the beginning like we didn't really talk about this but we were like gonna have to change the whole design because mm -hmm. there was like that whole period of time where we didn't touch anything yeah I mean I still don't like touch very much but like I'm so uh grateful that we could install it in this way mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. the backup plan we made, which I was very impressed and grateful to the whole public art fund team. Like we really tried, but it just like didn't work the right way. And so I think that like doing it the way that we got to like originally plan it was amazing. I think, um, yeah, I don't well, know. I think I think it is really a testament to you and a testament to your work and especially a testament to you know grabbing a chain and and interacting and pulling and 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 clanging the clapper against you know these these stellar stellar bell forms that you've made for reverberation so um, you know, with that, it's, it's six o'clock and, uh, you know, I just want to say thank you again to you, Davina, for this incredible exhibition and this wonderful uh, talk tonight. And thank you to all of the audience members who've joined us and asked questions. And I hope you all have a great night. And thanks again, Davina. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. And thank you to Cooper Union for hosting this talk. Goodbye, everyone. Thanks.